ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 141. Science Faction, the two quo qui fallacy. Sometimes referred to as the adorable fallacy. <laughs> It's also sometimes referred to as the U2 fallacy, not the band, uh, as in you as well. Like, hey, who smells? That homeless guy smells. And Damien as well. They both smell. Although that homeless guy was Bono. <laughs> uh, he's stopping AIDS. All right. Also sometimes called the appeal to hypocrisy, it is commonly employed as a red herring because it essentially takes the heat off the person who has made the fallacy. So here's the way it works. If we are having a debate and Damien makes an argument using a logical fallacy, if I then point out that Damien has made that horrible error as he usually does and has created just he said just another fallacy, just another reason to think he is doing something wrong. If he does that and I point it out and then his response is then to point out, oh, yeah, but you did this other thing before when we were talking and so therefore it all evens out. That's the two quo quo fallacy. Because essentially what you're saying is, because you messed up before, I have a right to mess up now, when it doesn't matter because, like an independent event, each one of those logical fallacies is its own thing. And your argument is just as invalid if you use it, regardless of how many logical fallacies the other person used before. If you had addressed my complaint when it happened, perhaps it wouldn't be thrown into your face passive-aggressively later. If you had finally cleaned and not smelled as bad as that bum, I wouldn't have to keep bringing it up. He's fucking Bono. So anyway, so you can obviously see how this is an easy logical fallacy to point out and also why it's effective, though, in argumentation. Even though it is a logical fallacy, people become defensive when all of a sudden you attack what they have done. So they attack you back. You become defensive and that red herring works. You go off on a, a tangent and trying to address what you talked about earlier. In essence, when you call out that logical fallacy, if somebody then replies with this, with this kind of hypocrisy fallacy, then what you have to do is say, okay, all right, fine. We will discuss what I did earlier. But right now we have to address that this is a logical fallacy and you have to admit it before we can keep going and talk about that thing from before. You'd it's, be so obnoxious in a relationship. I am so obnoxious in a relationship. You can talk to my wife about that. She's highly disappointed. With your logic and demanding that she address her issues as well as yours. <laughs> yeah, I do that all the time. It's, it's really annoying for You're anybody else. You're a bitch. And speaking of that bitch, I am your host, comedian and archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this evening? Doing great. Uh, I love being Bobby's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and somebody who would have made a much better wife, our scientist for the evening, Professor, no longer just doctor, but Professor Ava. How are you doing, Ava? I'm good. I'm so glad to be back here. It is good to have you back here, to have your positiveness. It was positiveness. a long summer without you guys. Yeah, and it's great to have you balance out, Damien, the, the positive, the goodness, the great vibes that are just coming from this side. It really just helps take this whole show up a few notches. The Jeez. authentic German accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was uh, Damien doing a perfect impression of Dr. Ava, myself, earlier. Professor. Professor. <laughs> yes. And if you want to see the professor and Damien, come on out to the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego at the top of Horton Plaza. They just finished construction on a big old plaza right along Broadway uh, at the north end of Horton Plaza. Come on out. Check that out. And when you're there, come on up to Madhouse Comedy Club. In between that, go ahead and check out our website at www.thesciencefaction.com, where you'll find all the articles we reference here, as well as some we didn't get to. And for now, let's get right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, article number one is actually two articles put together uh, very interesting. I don't know if a lot of times this happens where a bunch of research will come out at the same time because a bunch of data is released at the same time. So then work gets done and the two groups will compete with each other. But it's a race to publish. Yeah, th there was actually three separate groups doing work about the genetics of the Australia, Papua New Guinea area. All three of those groups published separate work in this week's issue of Nature. Uh, we're going to talk about two of those articles that are actually super, super interesting. They almost seem to contradict each other if the, you just look at the headlines and don't dive deep into them. So the third was bullshit. Yeah, I got to fuck that third. <laughs> Listen, Damien, I can bend the rules and make article number one be actually a, an amalgam of two articles. 
I can't break them and make it an amalgam of three. I just think our fans are worth it. We live in a society of rules, Damien. <laughs> so article number one, the genes down under, these two separate articles seem to have contradicting information, but in fact they're not at all, and they both have very, very interesting info that came right out of the DNA of living people. So let's go back and talk a little bit about what we knew before these articles about the peopling of Australia. I didn't know anything. You didn't know anything about the peopling of Australia? I don't How did you live your life? Did you know anything about the history of the more than 70 states in Germany? No, but none of that is interesting. I mean, the people of Australia. (laughs) Have you never had the regional delicacy? Boomerang? (laughs) I'm a vegetarian. (laughs) The reason Australia is so interesting is that it has been occupied for so long. We know for sure at least about 55 to 60,000 years Australia has been occupied. When we say Australia, we mean Australia and Papua New Guinea because up until about 10,000 years ago, that was a single landmass. Wait a second. I have to do something interesting now. Mm-hmm. I, I heard on Science Faction that whenever you want to retain a really boring fact, right. you should do – you should Exercise. I'm, I'm going to go for a run. Just I'll do be... some jumping jacks real quick. Thank uh-huh. you. Then you'll okay. be fine. Okay. Uh, <gasps> So, Australia was occupied a long time ago, and we thought for a long time that the Australians and Papua New Guineans represented the first migration out of Africa by a group of people, and then later migrations made up, you know, Europeans, Asians, and everybody else. We know for a fact that they interbred with different species, like the Denisovans, Neanderthals, and at least one other hominid species that we have not discovered yet. We have just found its evidence in the DNA of these people. That is how ashamed our, those ancestors were, that they, we got to bury all evidence of this. No- <laughs> Burn the bodies! <laughs> Nobody can know we fucked this. I like breeding. I'm paying attention. <laughs> So that's super interesting. We also thought that those Australians, like I said, represented the first instance out of Africa. But the problems we had was their genetics seemed to show that they were eh, somewhere near where other groups were. So around 70 to 80,000 years ago, they came out of Australia. But we were finding evidence of human occupation that were maybe closer to 100,000 or more years old that did not seem to fit in with other hominids. That was really intriguing because it seemed like human beings had been out there longer, but the genetic evidence seemed to suggest they were there for a shorter amount of time. Fast forward to these two studies that were just published. One of them shows an incredible amount of genetic diversity within Australian groups, but it also shows that that Australian group, the original founding group, is actually part of the same diaspora that left Africa that led to Asians, that led to Europeans, that led to everybody else. The only reason they have such dramatically different DNA is, one, their genetic isolation for such a long period of time in Australia, and two, the fact that they interbred so much with these other hominids. Oh, so excuse ba- me, Paul, I'm right here. Uh, Australian guy walking by who uh, who helps to memorize boring facts by doing <laughs> sweet character okay. work. All right. Oh, I, I'm really offended every time you keep saying Australians have this about genetic all, diversity. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about Aboriginal Australians, not... not colonists that then came over. Oh, thank me. God. If I had found out I had some Asian in me, I know me and my <laughs> lot of my white Australian friends would lose their shit. They're racist, but like in a funny way, right? They're like fun racists. Crikey. Yeah. When you, it's hard to hate a guy who's saying racist things like he's rusting in a gator. It's yeah. just a fun yeah. thing to watch. He's, lovable. he's a lovable racist. Indeed, so it turns uh. out these guys fucked other species so much that we thought they were furtherly distant related to, to us. We were like, they are so different from us because of their banging of these random Denisovans and other species. They must have left Africa thousands of years before the rest of us. As a racist Australian, I'm going to really misinterpret a lot of this information to prove my point. I could tell that. Uh, They also found that because Australians had been in Australia for so long, so many tens of thousands of years, they had dramatic, dramatic splits and genetic diversity. In fact, they had groups that were very, very distantly related to each other within Australia. So if you look at the Aborigines of southwestern Australia and compare them to the Aborigines of northeastern Australia, they are so distantly related that Native Americans in places like Florida or Mexico are more closely related to Siberians than these two Aboriginal Australian groups are related to each other. They have such a long split over 31,000 years ago that they haven't bred in more time than the Siberians and the Native Floridians. Okay, so the Aboriginal Australians are very distant from each other and they're also very distant from everyone else. Yes, And we've known that for... 
We've known that We've they were distant from everyone else for a long time. From everyone else for, for a long time, exactly. So what is exactly, maybe I missed this, uh-huh. what is exactly the piece of evidence that tells us that um, it's not as we always assumed because they left much earlier, but it's because they interbred with all basically had right. do what Australians do. So some of the genetic testing... Go on walkabouts. Yeah, the genetic testing we did was out, allowed us to narrow down when the group that left to form the Aboriginal people had left. And it turns out that with specific genetic studies that we can do now with the mass amount of people that they're doing, because before, this is what's really interesting, a lot of the genetic studies done on Australian Aborigines before had been done on three individuals. I see. Yeah. This took hundreds of individuals into account, so they got a more precise timeline and were able to narrow it down and be like, oh shit, we thought they left 10 or 15,000 years earlier. We were wrong. <laughs> so that is really interesting. The fact that people in Australia have that insane genetic diversity is super interesting. That's also a new discovery. I mean, if you were to say to somebody, "Who? what about these two people? You'd be like, oh, those are Australian Aborigines. You wouldn't say, oh, they're more distantly related to each other than Siberians are to the Mayans, you know? Well, anybody who studies the didgeridoo could tell you yes. that. Northern, I mean, come on. Any didgeridoo <laughs> novice can tell you a northern versus southern didgeridoo. I believe didgeridoos are actually only in one group of Australians, so uh, one small group. But they're very you Passed by didgeridoo test. <laughs> <laughs> How many times has that been said to somebody? <laughs> in Australia, a lot more than it is here. Uh, so that is super interesting in and of itself, so showing all that genetic diversity showing when they migrated out of Africa but what was even more interesting is one that almost seems to contradict that it looks at the natives in Papua New Guinea what it found out is that 2% of Papua New Guineans DNA comes from an ancient migration from Africa of a group that left Africa about 120,000 years ago that otherwise went completely extinct we can't find their genes anywhere else they left Africa, apparently did a bunch of stuff, which seems to correlate to all that archaeology we have in the area that predates the exodus that we know about. So they were out there running around doing their things. They were in Papua New Guinea. At some point, other human beings came out of Africa, apparently slaughtered them all, or they all died on their own or something, except in one spot in Papua New Guinea where they survived and they contributed enough of their DNA that this ancient migration of 120,000 years ago out of Africa still is alive and well in the blood of modern-day Papua New Guineans. That is amazing. So 2% is usually considered below the bar for something that's, you know, you, you have a confidence interval. Well, oh, so if you're so, talking about a 5% confidence exactly. interval. So, so, so we're wh- saying 2% of their total DNA, but that's not measured off a single individual. So if you, right. you, you can get accuracies up to, to much better than 2%, but certainly up to 2% if you're looking at population rather than individual. And how, how unlikely is it that these 2% aren't due to a random mutation who, that happened to look like the DNA from the, Good question. that population? Good question. So in order for that to happen, though, because of the way it's not dispersed into just a single person or a single couple people, which you could make that right, argument. Exactly. It would still but be, it could have been a mutation many generations ago, right? It, no, because of the way genetics work, we can tell when that appeared in a population based on its dispersal and spread. If you were looking at a single individual sample, you're right. You could make that mistake. It would be highly unlikely because you're talking about a one in a million chance that the exact nucleotides are going to line up to mimic the ones that we saw in Africa 120,000 years ago. But it's still possible. It essentially becomes mathematically impossible once you start looking at population genetics of a group of people because it just couldn't happen that way. But good question, and it's something we should always be aware of, is when you have these major groundbreaking discoveries, when you figure out that a group of humans left Africa 120,000 years ago and interbred with one with modern-day humans in one spot, you should always be skeptical and you should look for the possibility of mistakes. And we could still find out that there are mistakes in this, but right now, based on what they've published, This is really intriguing data, and this is going to change how we think of human migrations out of Africa into Southeast Asia and human populations. We put Homo sapien back about 200,000 years ago. That's when we think Homo sapien actually became a species that we recognize. But 130,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago, whatever we would call that, whatever Homo sapien was running around Africa, was very, very different. So that is a very ancient genetic infusion, and it is possible that we might be seeing these genetic infusions pop up other places once we start doing mass genetic analysis. But for now, it looks like it's restrained to this one island. There was this um, Disney cruise precursor. They brought all those Africans everywhere in, like, different spots, you know, and then they bred and then they went home again. Okay. So (laughs) it was like Noah's Ark? Right. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. 
It's another another piece of evidence for Noah's Ark. One of the ideas on why this happened only in New Guinea <laughs> is that at this point, even the the channel that separates the mainland, uh, which would be Australia, Papua, and New Guinea, uh, from from the mainland Asia, there has always been water there. It's just been narrower during the ice ages. So even during the ice ages, there was a deep trough there that you could you had to have boats to cross over. So we know they got there at some point somehow. Uh, probably had some kind of boat, some kind of primitive technology. But what probably saved them for so long, why they lasted in Papua New Guinea for such a long time and apparently went extinct everywhere else, was probably that strand of water. That strait of water probably protected them from our ancestors coming through and killing them all the earlier. Or the Mongolians. Yeah. <laughs> they could have been caught by Genghis Khan. <laughs> Only a scant 100,000 years later. <laughs> Time and distance. All right, let's move right on to Science Fighters. Science Fighters and Science Fighters. Which side are you on? It's a little confusing, I know. It's a double entendre. You know what? Just listen. You'll, you'll like it. All right, this is Science Fighters, where, of course, we look at people who fight either for or against science. I, I'm not going to play your fucking game. <laughs> this is not a game, Davey. I'm just present information about a group of people who are fighting either for or sometimes, I know it's hard for you to believe this, against science. Yeah, I'm just not going to jump to conclusions. I'm not going to take a side on this. I yeah, abstain. You, you usually get this wrong, which is weird because everybody else seems to have no problem with it. But, but indeed, so today's science fighter is journalist Tom Wolf. So those of you who might not be familiar. That's a real science fighter. Yeah. yeah. Dick Wolf's son. Yeah. <laughs> Law and Order High School. That's right. Uh, Tom Wolfe, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar, he's one of the pioneers of what we call new journalism. He started in, I believe, the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s with a different type of journalism that used literary techniques, pe- something that was people were familiar with in literature and writing. He would use things like perspective shifts. He would use things like he would use present tense instead of past tense when describing an event going on. He basically brought these techniques that writers had been using for a long time into journalism to make that more of a... Uh, an interesting thing. So a lot of the journalism that we have now comes out of this tradition. So it comes out of the idea of we're going to write as an entertainment medium rather than what existed before him, which was much more of journalism as simply stating facts. This is what happened. Thank you, Tom Wolf. Hit. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. He was the precursor to TMZ. <laughs> In a way, <laughs> yes. That would be the newest journalism. <laughs> So he's a very prominent writer. He influenced the public a lot. If you've ever used the term pushing the envelope, he created that term. He wrote uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, which was a popular novel and then eventually a popular movie. He was credited with the term trophy wife as well, which he didn't actually... I already like this guy. But he actually didn't co- coin the term trophy wife. He, uh, he used the term x-ray wife to describe like the super skinny chicks that really rich guys did end he, up marrying. Did he do anything um, that was kind of like non-sexist and body shaming he's making fun of them that's not body shaming <laughs> he's making fun of them. i don't know i looked it up on my phone i figured out where he got the term pushing the envelope from uh-huh. it was from a short essay he wrote about bullying his mailman <laughs> that's also, a derogatory term for postal workers by the way also release the dog which was, uh, was the other one he also uh, wrote who let the dogs out yes he founded the baja bin <laughs> If you do read his blogs, Tom Wolfe has recently published something that caused a huge stir in the science community when he basically said, oh, that whole like evolution shit, that's bullshit. I just don't buy it. And I think it's a great example of this because I, I've actually eh, been somewhat familiar with Tom Wolfe for most of my life. I've seen a lot of his writings. I, I knew his impact on journalism. And I always really respected the guy. I thought uh, what he did in terms of seeing what was what was around before him, if you look at 1950s-style journalism of like, then the cop showed up at 9.55 p.m. They arrested the suspect at 10.02 p.m. And then he decided to put all this color commentary into it. He, he invented Fox News, too. I yeah, see what right. you're saying. No, he decided to do things like uh, perspective switch. So when you were doing that, you would, you would hear the first part of the story from the criminal who's being arrested and the second part from the cop who is arresting him. And, and you would see the story in a much broader, fuller life. And he brought what I thought was a narrative to journalism. And I always really respected the guy. I thought he was a great writer. It proves that you shouldn't put anyone up on a pedestal too much that their ideas are unassailable. Because obviously he's wrong on this. He has no expertise in evolution or natural selection. He has really no expertise in science in general. And 
And so we should see that and we should say, okay, well, Tom Wolf's not an expert at that. It shouldn't be any groundbreaking thing to anyone else. We should just say in the same way that a professional athlete might have a stupid opinion on something, they're good at catching a ball, not thinking. It's interesting because he also wrote this book on Chomsky, uh-huh. likening Chomsky to Darwin, but also saying that Chomsky is a fraud. Like, I guess that reveals what, he's, what right, he thinks, right? Exactly. But it's, it's interesting because he and Chomsky, they must be roughly the same age. And it, what you're saying about Tom Wolfe reminds me a lot about Chomsky. Because really? Chomsky has a lot of great ideas or had a lot of great ideas. And he's obviously still very influential mm-hmm. in his political opinions and obviously super, super smart. But, you know, when it comes to linguistics, there's lots of stuff that maybe we shouldn't take right. that seriously anymore in the past 10 years. I'm going to get beat up by my colleagues now. No, no, no. no. It's it's a, like, it, my maybe colleagues it's a matter- Bruno and Max. <laughs> There's just people like that around who you can say, you don't even say this is a dumb person. You say this is a very, very smart person yep. and they are very accomplished in their own particular it's field. It's just that if we have stupid ideas, right, right, nobody notices. Right. I mean, with Damien, it's a different story. But if, we, you know, normal, young, smart people have stupid ideas we once talked- in a while, nobody is actually listening and nobody judges on, uh, us on them as we, much as We talked people. the other week about how how most of Sigmund Freud's stuff was complete bullshit. Most of the science and, and stuff he did was complete bullshit. He still founded psychotherapy and psychodynamics, and he is still the reason that we have legitimate psychological research going on. So we can say he did some good things and he did these things, but he was still wrong about a bunch of stuff. Jane Goodall here oh, walking God by. God damn it. Oh. This is the best example. I'm going to stick up for Mr. Wolf, <sighs> though I disagree with many of his writings on evolution. Yes, that's right. But when they came for Jane Goodall, people People were silent, so I'm speaking out. Right. Yes, of course, Jane Goodall, the famous chimp researcher who lived in the woods for a long time, researched the chimps first person, uh, but also has some nutty beliefs about things like Sasquatch. They do subsist mostly off nuts. Oh, I God agree. We, all right, yes, Jane. I am simply saying that once somebody has accomplished something fantastic in their field, uh-huh. they are a made man, yeah, okay. as it were. <laughs> And then from then on, your ideas are unquestionable. <laughs> Me and Mr. Wolf actually are writing a law. That I actually heard a rumor that uh, you actually questioned one of those made men scientist uh, Billy Bats in a bar. and uh, Beat people his g- ass. <laughs> and, and in the end, you end up having to pay for it with your life. <laughs> yes, the chapter on Jane Goodall has ended. <laughs> All right, guys. So a good thing to keep in mind. Nothing's changing when I'm not here. No, not at all. Not at all. All of you know Jane Goodall has been gone since you were here. (laughs) I'm starting to think you're Jane Goodall. I'm starting to think that you cannot keep up with me because I'm female and you need to impersonate another female. Ooh. Ooh. It is only that I've learned to not impersonate German females (laughs) because you quest me on things I can't possibly answer. (laughs) Speaking of things you can't possibly answer, let's move right on to I Call BS. I Call BS. I Call I Call I Call I Call I Call Ring Ring. I Call BS. All right, I Call BS is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are true and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yeah, let's, let's play this biased-ass game once again. <laughs> I've been kicked in the nuts 140 times. What's 141? (laughs) All right. Article number one. Women, but not men, have invisible stripes of different cell types throughout their body. I have a question. Yeah. I have many questions. Okay. Are the cell types visible for the men? Or are they just... Nope. Don't exist for men. They just don't exist. Exactly. So, Damien, do you think this is science or bad science? This is science, and they're not invisible. That's just how good she is at makeup. And Professor Ava. I'm going to say it's science, and I really hate that you're body shaming the people who have given birth. (laughs) Article number two. A six-inch tall preserved body of a six- to eight-year-old boy with ten ribs instead of the normal 12, a cone-shaped head, and other alien features turns out to be completely human. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. What I'm more concerned about is how they got Simon Birch's skeleton when he's not dead. And Ava. How much is that in centimeters? Uh, 13. Where did they discover that? The Atacama Desert. Atacama? Where's that? Chile. Well, many things are possible in Chile, right? I'm still going (laughs) to... 
<laughs> you and Avita Perone, yeah. <laughs> Both have the same mentality. <laughs> I'm still going to say this is bad science. Something's wrong about this story. Indeed. Article number three. Tattoos may be a form of medical treatment prescribed by doctors. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. Also, there is now a sleazier doctor than the medicinal weed card doctor. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> My name is Tiny. I'll put a sweet heart on your back. <laughs> Say goodbye to diabetes. <laughs> oh, you hear the doctor right up on his sweet Harley. Yeah. Ooh, the doc's in. <laughs> and Dr. Ava. I think this is science because, you know, those tattoos, there are like, they're marks on the body where right. you have to put in like insulin. Oh, or... they do do that. Yeah, that's right for, right for chemotherapy and stuff. Exactly. All right. Article number four. Researchers have recently found that Crohn's disease is caused by a virus. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science, but mainly because my understanding of Crohn's disease is it's the disease old women get that make them look like witches. <laughs> you old crone, get out of here. Practicing black magic usually causes it. That's actually where the name came from, because it's a disease that makes you shit like a witch. <laughs> shit like a witch. Is that a, is that a saying in German? Yeah, Tom Wolf came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Ava. Uh, I think this is science. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. Can you also talk a little bit again about Crohn's disease? Oh, sure. Crohn's disease is something that's basically an autoimmune disease in which your body attacks your own intestines. So similar to things like arthritis, where your body is attacking your joints, this is where your body is attacking your intestines. It causes a lot of intestinal bowel discomfort. You have to constantly go to the bathroom. It's, it's actually fairly debilitating through a lot of people's lives, depending on how bad they have it. But we all just kind of laugh about it because it's kind of about poop. So You laugh about it. <laughs> I'm pooping. That's how I'm, That's I'm right. silently protesting. <laughs> that is Damien's form of protest every time. All right. Let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. Women, but not men, have invisible stripes of different cell types throughout their body. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. And it's for an interesting reason. Women have two X chromosomes, one from the mother and one from their father. Men obviously only have one from their mother. The one from their father is a Y chromosome. So one of the things that happens in biology is if you have two types of something, or a replica in this case, like you do with an X chromosome, you have to do a methylation or some kind of other process to keep one of those X chromosomes from expressing itself. So you only express one X chromosome. Otherwise, you'd have big problems you would, similar to people with like Down syndrome. So you need to be able to, to control that expression. When there is a young embryo and it's starting to divide, it has both its mother and its father's X chromosome. In the division process, when it's still very small, about half the cells become mom's X and half the cells become father's X by essentially silencing the other one. So half of them silence the mother's X chromosome, half of them silence the father's X chromosome. From there on, as those cells divide, every time that cell divides, it divides with the X chromosome it has. That's not silenced. So all the cells that were around Ava's father's X chromosome all kept dividing and dividing and dividing so that you have this stripe of your father's chromosome where those, that original cell progenitor was and then a stripe of where your mother's X chromosome would be and then another one and another one. If you were to look at this, if you were able to see which X chromosome was activated on a given woman and look at them, they would look like they are striped because any given cell in a general area divided and grew and grew and grew. And so they would be striped with the X chromosome of their father and then their mother and their father and their mother and it would be kind of a mix-up of the two. You can put a picture on the website, Damien said, as he assigned Bobby homework. <laughs> there, is, there is a picture on our website if you want to check it out, www.thesciencefaction.com. It's kind of interesting. They, they did a visualization of what this would look like. But it's an interesting idea because it brings up certain ideas of gene silencing, which are very important in, in modern-day biology. And it's part of what makes us who we are, not just the genes we have, but the genes we have that are turned on or off. And by the way, that is where calico cats come from. So calico cats are the cats with, with the coat that is mixed up of the, uh, in different colors. Those can only be female. You can only have female calico cats because what happens with them is their fur actually expresses the fur color of their mother and father. And so similar to the stripes that we would see on all females if they actually display this, the calico cats actually display those stripes, and you can see a visual rendition of what human females would look like if they did the same. All right, article number two. 
a six inch tall preserved body of a six to eight year old boy with 10 ribs instead of 12, a cone shaped head and other alien features was discovered and turns out to be completely human. Damien thinks this is true. Ava thinks this is false. And this one is science, believe it or not. Nicknamed Ada, A-T-A, it was discovered in the Ada Countman Desert in 2003. Clever. Yeah. It was originally <laughs> thought to be a very old discovery because this is a place of very old civilizations. In fact, funny story, this was discovered in 2003. I think a year after that, I was doing field work not too far away in the Atacama Desert in Peru. Name dropper. Yeah, I know. Um, desert names. <laughs> it, it's, it is actually the driest desert in the world. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, <laughs> We still had paint on adobe walls from the Inca period, so, you know. I've been there. Where have yeah, you been? Yeah, exactly. So they discovered this tiny little thing in a pouch in an abandoned village in Chile, and they thought maybe it was really, really old because the, it is the best preserved desert in the world. Uh, turns out modern testing that, we ju- that this new report just came out uh, suggests that it's actually only a few decades old. But it's very interesting. Now, this is something you absolutely need to go to our website right now. As we're talking about this, go to our website and look at a picture of it because it's going to blow your mind. It looks like what a dumb person thinks an alien looks like. So I, I'll just say it looks like an alien. It, it's got the big elongated head. It's super tiny. Again, six inches long. Uh, originally, the idea was this had to be maybe a fetus, like a, an aborted fetus with some bad you know, genetic defects and stuff. The problem is, on further investigation, not only did they find teeth, full-grown teeth coming out that really are more representative of about a six- to eight-year-old kid, but the bone plates had hardened to the point that, uh, that you would expect at about a six- to eight-year-old kid. But... I mean, I'm really. That makes me really sad. This story, right? Right. So, but but on the other hand, obviously there was something wrong with this right. boy. Right. So maybe it was a fetus. And maybe it was. And that is what. That, so this is what the new information is telling us: is right now all the evidence points to it not being a fetus. But you're right. The same yeah. genetic conditions that caused the problems that it currently has exactly. could also cause that. Now, when it was first found, it was thought to be a total fraud. Somebody thought it was a doll somebody mocked up. It's owned by a private collector, and he started allowing it to be scientifically investigated. And we could do things like cat scans and be like, oh, holy shit, this isn't a doll. It's got lungs and a heart and like the full nine yards. That's the other thing. Fully developed organs and tissues that you wouldn't have in a fetus. Like, very, very interesting. I think in the end it's probably going to come out that this was some kind of stillbirth or fetus or something right. with some kind of genetic condition that allowed yes. for both growth plates and, uh, and other things. One of the ideas is that it might be progeria, which is a disease in which uh, individual ages way beyond a yeah. year. So if you had a fetal or maybe even not fetal but young infant with uh, very bad uh, progeria, maybe this is how it would manifest itself. Though it has been noted – while that's the leading explanation of how this could have happened progeria cases as we know them do not lead to this in fetuses that we know of and this particular fetus does not have the genetics for progeria i didn't watch the end of benjamin button is that how it ended Yeah, that's exactly how it happened he became a six inch tall alien in the atacama desert a couple of decades you said it lines up very very interesting stuff go take a look at that picture it will freak you the fuck out article number three Tattoos may soon be a form of medical treatment prescribed by doctors. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. By the way, I totally forgot. Ava is right. They do do this for chemotherapy to like line up the lasers and stuff. So in that way, they probably already do. Good point, Ava. That's why we bring the doctor in. But this is a whole different idea. This is a proof of principle study led by Baylor scientist Beaton, and it was reported on Nature's Open Access Journal. And it shows that nanoparticles modified with polyethylene glycol are conveniently choosy as they are taken up by cells in the immune system. And that could be a plus for patients with autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis or, as we talked about before, Crohn's disease. Because one focus of the study was that if they put these just under the skin, carbon-based particles form a dark spot that fades over about a week. So it's a temporary tattoo, not permanent. And they're slowly released into circulation. So you basically insert these with a tattoo gun, just like you would a normal tattoo. You could even have them you know, do a naked dancing bear on my arm, like do whatever. And then over about a week, your body slowly kind of eats those up and takes those in. And that becomes part of an ability to train your immune system not to fight your own body, which is what we want to do in those cases. So in this sense, that tattoo type technology could actually lead to a cure or at least a treatment for these autoimmune diseases. So very, very interesting stuff. Hopefully Hopefully that works out. Article number four. Researchers have recently found that Crohn's disease is caused by a virus. Damien thinks this is false. Ava thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. 
Congratulations, Damien. You won. Yep. Way to go. That's Good job. Enough. That's what the superior competitor won, and I'm not talking trash to Ava. <laughs> I am gloating for Bobby. At, Are you? Why uh, Why would you be so mean to Ava here? I, we, we do this game civilly, Damien. We do dis- it. We discuss do this it. game. We talk about this civilly <laughs> like adults talking about scientific matters. I don't understand why you're bringing emotion into this that at has all. That never been a part of this show, any segment. I think if you <laughs> rewind back to any episode we've ever done, you'll see that we acted with nothing but respect and adult rational thinking. It seems weird that you would bring this down to a lower level. If I edited the show right now, yeah. the fans listening would be introduced to a montage right, right now. Be a montage the next 20 of, minutes. of me going, uh, respectfully, Damien, you seem to have gotten this answer wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, but you appear to have lost. But good luck next time. That's what the montage would be like if you just rewound to other episodes. I, I love that this bit keeps going. <laughs> uh, it is indeed false, they f- but they did find something about Crohn's disease. They found that in addition to known bacteria that can lead to Crohn's disease, a specific type of fungus can also cause an inflated immune response seen in Crohn's. That's really interesting because, like I said, Crohn's can be quite debilitating. We know there are certain bacteria, gut bacteria, that are associated with it. We've been trying gut bacteria transplants with varying success to try and help people with Crohn's disease. But here's something that we might not have calculated. It might not just be bacterial infection that's leading the immune system to to do that. It might be fungal infection. That's really important because guess what? Antibiotics aren't going to help against that fungus. And if you can get in there and stop it with something else, you know, with an antifungal agent, that might be a better way to cure certain people who suffer from Crohn's. Could you tattoo antifungal there you agents go, yeah. on there? We'll just tattoo some tenactin up inside that rectum. <laughs> I want it of John Madden. Aww. It's an inside joke. <laughs> All right. Well, Damien, congratulations on your congratulations. win. Congratulations. I, I wish I could congratulate you on your sportsmanship, but I certainly can't. This is the most civil you've been to me after a game. Winner, this loss, is, this is, I usually act civilly. It's you that's clearly acting completely out of place here. Listen, I'm not, I don't mean to insult Dr. Ava. You did. I just mean to say I kicked her ass. <laughs> All right. And I'm I'm perfectly happy cuz you also need some some encouragement. I don't know what's going on in life. You something to live need, for. You also need something to look forward to yeah. when I come. Yes, because I'm not a mother like you. I didn't get that gift. You don't even have stripes. <laughs> I'm a calico dude. <laughs> I feel like that's a really bad country song. All right. <laughs> Let's move right on to the bit everyone hates. Damien channels a dead scientist. And now, Damien channels a dead scientist. Don't go fuck yourself. I see dead people. Okay, for those of you who don't know, this is a bit where Damien pretends that a spirit, which doesn't exist, comes into his body, and then that spirit is of some kind of famous dead scientist, and then he pretends to be that dead scientist, and it's very lame. So, uh, Damien, if you will. Yes, this is the bit where I channel a dead scientist, and Bobby is furious the whole time. Dr. Ava, are you ready? (sighs) So you don't even have to do the spirits. shaking thing with it. And again, you Come still say me. spirits. You, you don't need to do this because nobody here believes you. So you're not putting on a farce that anybody would, would buy. You could just go into your fake bit. I don't understand. It is I, Alfred Kinsey, who has summoned me into this very well-endowed gentleman. Wait, wait, wait. Is Kinsey, is Kinsey Southern? What was that? This is not Southern. I grew up most of my life in Indiana from oh, okay. Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how people sound and listen to through old timey recordings. I, I invite everybody <laughs> in our right, <laughs> to go out and listen to a video interview with Albert, Alfred Kinsey. All right. Speaking of which, who is this large dicked gentleman? I, you know what? I again, would love to have had him as a grad this, student. This is another one of your things, Damien, where you pretend that a scientist not only inhabits your body, but then comments on your genitalia, which is always kind of weird. I think it's weird that you are denying there's a controlled experiment. A bunch I of think, people have inhabited this elephant dicked dude. I think in this context, it's not that weird, right? <laughs> eh, it is Kinsey. Kinsey would be the one that's a little bit Kinsey exceptional. Would, yeah. And Freud. Yeah, okay, fair enough. There was quite a hubbub about Damien's cock in the dead no, science. There's not. No, there's <laughs> no, not. No, no, I am tired of these bullshit prop-up lies. We also don't want to hear about right, that. Listen, I, I get so many t- times to come to Earth per year, and I'm using it with you. If you have any questions for the electrifying Alfred Kinsey, All right, please. so Kinsey, for those of you guys who don't know, Kinsey was a sex researcher back in, like, the 50s. I think he actually uh, started some of his seminal work before that. I was a professor of etymology, biology, sexology. And Kinsology. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. You started with entomology, right? Because you were you were super into bugs. 
you were super into how they mated and you were interesting in different mating patterns which led you down the course of looking at human sexuality yes i find that humans mate not unlike the bull wasp the bull wasp. which i did my doctoral thesis on because you never know what questions Bobby's going to ask when you come down to Earth from heaven. That's true. You don't, Damien, pretending to be Kinsey. And so you, you came up with a bunch of ideas about human sexuality. Some of it was kind of credited to starting the sexual revolution. But some of it was also kind of like we talked about with Freud before. It was a little bit uh, sketchy. Yes, I did. I, I did overrepresent homosexuals in my uh -huh. sample size. But it should be said that later on, the Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex and Gender Reproduction, named after yours truly, right. at Indiana University, found that the results of my study, when corrected for with the proper variables, were not that different. <laughs> so what do you think now about, about um, same-sex marriage? I am all for it. Now, I, I personally prefer to be married to a woman and be afraid to bisexualize my life all over the state of Indiana. Well, but, but what's weird is you say married to a woman, but you were one of those researchers who would participate in sex acts and, like, encourage your students to do the same in order for them to better understand the people they were looking at, which is an insane form of logic. I, I talk a lot about my wife's genital regions, and I encourage my students to take a hands-on approach. She loves the young D. <laughs> but, but to say that, hey, students, you guys should all go bang randomly just for no reason so you could better uh, relate to the patients coming in, that would be like telling drug counselors, like, you need to shoot up a bunch of H to make sure you can relate to all these people, these addicts coming in. I don't know if that comparison actually holds. There, there, there's something a little bit more healthy about... Not if you're in a married, committed relationship and you're fucking a bunch of grad students in your attic, which is what he did. That is... And that's... taping it. What do you have to say? And, oh, what if, you wouldn't want a nerdy virgin doctor being your sex counselor. The Catholic Church does that. Maybe we should get back to the scientific um, findings. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, uh, well, I'd like to reproduce one of my studies. Ava, if you'd take off your top and come <laughs> over here... Tell me, Dr. Kinsey, you had something that, that people just call the Kinsey Papers. That's kind of like the general word, term they use for it. Kinsey Report. Yeah, the Kinsey Report. But they were actually made up of two separate books that you published. What were the titles of those books? I believe you're referring to the sexual behavior in human male and the same title for the human female. Yeah, that's right. Interestingly, you published one of those before the other. Which one, which one came first? I said them in the order in oh, which they okay. were published. And, and they seem to be a gap in between those two. How long was that gap? Three years. It was five years. Thank you very much. I have proof that Kinsey is not here. <laughs> that is nothing but a Damien. The first published in 1948, second in 1953. Thank you so much, research skills. Boom. I, I published it, but it was not released uh, to the public because uh, it, it mentioned female orgasms, uh, and society was not ready for such a thing. But I do believe, by the way, that you did it. Uh, not you, because obviously, as I just proved, no, no, you're no, not Kinsey. No, 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 you're right. Your Freudian slip was correct. But uh, as... as as Kinsey discovered, he was one of the first people to find out that uh, clitoral orgasms were no different than vaginal orgasms, right? Was that the whole deal? They were very different, but <laughs> I prefer the anal orgasm That's myself. <laughs> I've read that about you. Oh, did you know that as a child, I would stick things into my urethra? Straws, the dog's tail. A lot of people do feel that a lot of your work was really just you acting out certain sexual desires, needs, and beliefs that you personally had. What do you think of that now in, in reference to all the sexual work that's been done since then? I think it's very nice for a lot of my critics to criticize me after the sexual revolution that I started. I grew up to a Methodist preacher father who made me pray every day for Sunday and would beat me savagely when he caught the dog's tail in my urethra. That is a common thing about old-timey Indiana dads. They have, like, two rules. Don't wear your shoes in the house and no dog tail in the, in the urethra. Me and Dr. Jones were actually the two prof most exciting professors at my university. <laughs> uh, There's absolutely both had, no doubt about that. We both had a lot of adventures. I would never understood why he did his clothed. <laughs> All right. If you replace cave and rolling ball with my wife's bosoms and cunnilingus. No, it was a cave. We did a lot of our work in a cave. All right, Damien, pretending to be Kinsey, is, have I thoroughly debunked this? Is this done yet? 
yeah, this is done, but it has nothing to do with debunking. I, 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 I can see why the other scientists don't say very kind things about you. In fact, that's the one thing they hate more than Jews up there. Yeah, I believe is, as you guys get together and talk about how much you hate Jews and about Damien's penis. That's, yeah. that's how it works. We were doing coke with Freud recently, and we went on quite a rant. All right, well, I'm going to go back off and jerk off to other scientists doing work. Goodbye, everybody. <sighs> Who is it this time? Uh, it sounded like your version of Edison from the other week, but slightly worse. I don't control the way scientists sound. I just <laughs> no, think- you do, because they're not actual scientists. It's you doing an impression of scientists. Like, oh, you're not- By Can't every we- definition you could think of, you control how they sound. They're getting used to my vocal cords. You know what? I don't need to explain... Why do I feel fisted? Who is the scientist this week? <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for coming back for Science Faction 141, where you learned about the two quoque fallacy, about how the genetics of Australia and Papua New Guinea are completely rewriting the history of humankind. You learned why Tom Wolfe was both a genius and an idiot, why women have invisible stripes, how a six-inch tall six-year-old boy's body was discovered in the Chilean desert, how tattoos might help you with your medical diseases, and how Crohn's disease might be caused by a fungus. Thank you so much, and come on back next week for Science Faction 142. I've run into a lot of six-inch boys, but I prefer them bigger. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>